Welcome to the GCN Show. Coming up this week, is cycling now too complicated? Does it matter? And is it driving people away from the sport? Plus, Trek bikes are adjusting their strategy. Which seems strange, doesn't it? That it's taken them 20 months. You can film a music video in an indoor velodrome. I have remembered a specific example. Go on. Uh, Tinder. A big pun? I just can't imagine anyone getting pulled over for the wrong colour light on a bike. Well, oh, I don't know, mate. This week in the world of cycling, we learn that the UCI is listening. After the public outcry about the new Giro time trial helmet that looks like it's been stolen from the set of space balls, they've launched an inquiry into ugly lids. Woohoo! Yeah, now some say it was all down to Daniel Lloyd. And I'm actually not joking here. The Lantern Rouge podcast and Spencer from The Move both said it was down to Dan. Uh, so basically, what I want to know is what would you like to happen this week, Dan? Very good question. I don't think I don't want to ban anything else. Maybe the UCI could make a kind of cycling app Ooh. where people around the world can all watch live cycling. I think that might be a bit too might soon. Be a bit too soon, soon might yeah, it? does. I think we're still a bit sore. <laughs> right, we'll have more on that UCI situation in just a few moments. Uh, we also learned that you can film a music video in an indoor velodrome. We did, yeah. Here is French singer Pierre Danet with Carry On. Carry on, carry on. I miss you so much when you're gone. Now, I've got to say, Dan, he looks pretty comfortable riding on a velodrome at 45 kilometres an hour whilst singing. He does, but I couldn't help but notice he's only playing his guitar while he's on the indoor trainer. That would be impressive, riding a guitar on the bank at 45 k's an hour. Yes. Riding a guitar, playing a guitar, <laughs> riding a bike. Um, I did actually ask why he filmed it in a velodrome. Yeah. And? Uh, well, it's actually really cool. Um, so he loves riding, he says, and has got properly into track cycling. But the reason why he's filmed it in a velodrome is because, and I quote, Carry On is a song about the difficulty of moving forward in life after the loss of a loved one. And then it struck Pierre while training at the track that it was kind of ironic that even though he's riding faster than ever, his GPS data showed that he was basically staying in the same mm. place, according to Strava. So there you go. Uh, incidentally, you can find Pierre Danet on Spotify as well as YouTube. I just like the GSN show, in fact, these yeah. days, just to remind you all. We also learned this week that Trek bikes are adjusting their strategy, uh, making cuts to spending of 10%, but perhaps more significantly, reducing the number of bike options they sell by 40%, and they hope to do that by 2026. Yeah, so the technical term for this is reducing the number of SKUs. Now, SKU stands for Stock Keeping Unit. So, for example, a Trek Damani SLR6, the so Shimano 105, is one model of bike, but it comes in eight different sizes, okay? So that would be eight different SKUs. However, it also comes in six color options. So suddenly, it's not eight, it's 56 SKUs in one model. But then that's only the half of it, because on the website, I counted 22 different Trek Damani models. Crikey. Uh, it costs a lot for a brand to create those level of options, of course. That is a lot of stock. Yeah. At the end of the season, a lot of possible bikes that need discounting. But bear in mind that Trek, like most major brands, also have at least three different road bike options in their own portfolio as well. Yeah, no, I did count, Stan. There are only 13 Madon models right. and 18 Imondas. But it does make things easier. Though, it does, doesn't, doesn't it? it? Yeah. So just the 53 different road bikes to choose from yes. then, each with up to 56 SKUs. Yeah, plus the e-bikes. Yeah, plus the e-bikes. And the gravel bikes. Okay, yes, that is a headache for the brand, <laughs> isn't it? But also, that's a lot of choice for consumers. Yeah. A veteran bike tester, Guy Kestervan, wrote an interesting article on this, slimming down move by Trek, pointing out they are definitely not the only brand looking at streamlining, and that as well as holding too much stock, crippling the bike industry, and the costs associated with more SKUs, uh, actually having too much choice could be putting consumers off buying a bike in the first place. Well, yeah. This begs the question, doesn't it? Have we, as in has the bike industry, made cycling too complicated so that it's just off-putting to new cyclists and off-putting to old ones as well? well? To answer that question, 
I reckon we need to wind the clock back to simpler times, don't they? About 30 years ago. Oh, so back yeah. then, you could walk into your local bike shop and choose to buy a road bike, a touring bike, a mountain bike, but only just by that point. No, it was the 90s. 30 years ago. Well, yeah, I guess so, yeah. Well, like your time flies, doesn't <laughs> it? Uh, I guess you could also get a beer max bike yeah. and maybe a shopping bike you of sorts. You get a shopping bike for sure, yeah. So five different bike options, mm. basically, which is the same number of drop handlebar bike options from a single brand yeah. now. Um, so I can absolutely see how it would put people off. I actually, in parallel to this, I suffered from consumer paralysis just yesterday, okay? Right. Um, there was so much choice when I was looking for a cordless drill driver that I actually didn't end up buying one for fear of getting it wrong. Crikey. If anyone could help Si choose a cordless drill driver, I'm sure you'd very much appreciate it. Yes, I would, yeah. I would like the kind of um, the kind of drill that's a bit like a gravel bike, I was thinking. Yeah, all? so an all-rounder, capable of like rugged, dusty drilling and driving jobs, as well as like smoother, cleaner stuff. Well, good luck with that. Thanks, man. I do want to decide whether the issue is less about the choice available than the choice of reviews that you can find, well, plus information that recommends you products as you found. In years gone by, there was choice available, but then you would put faith in your local shop, wouldn't it? Either bike shop or DIY store, to guide your purchase and not really question whether it was the right one or not. Yeah, I mean, that is true. But I mean, even getting the right size of bike now seems to be getting tougher, doesn't it? When Ollie made that video recently on GCN Tech where he recommended that people got a bike fit before spending loads of money on a new bike, it is absolutely mm. the right common sense thing to do. But I think that's a fairly recent phenomenon, isn't it? I don't yeah. remember people getting bike fits before buying new no, bikes. No, I think you're right. And actually, I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, Giants, incidentally, well, not incidentally, actually. Okay. We'll get on to the point in a second. They launched a new version of their venerable TCR road bike. It's now the 10th generation of that bike, which revolutionised the industry nearly 30 years ago. And part of the reason was it promised to simplify sizing and reduce the number of skews. I think it's a skew. Skews. I mean, I don't know, but I, you know, I'm sort of like, yeah. I think that I think I remember something. Anyway, I'll, I'll go with you. Okay. S K U. Yeah. I mean, we got things quite wrong with the Finland city last we did, week, yeah. didn't we? Yeah. It wasn't our fault, though. No, it wasn't our I'm fault. Spelling on another word. <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh, more on Aulu later on. Um, anyway, back to the giant. So previously, bike si brands had sizes increasing basically like one centimeter at a time, mm. didn't they? But then the TCR came in only three different sizes. However, the frame design allowed loads of seat per adjustment and also the front end allowed loads of adjustment as well with this special stem. Mm, I remember it well. But we do now seem to have gone back to the bad old days, haven't we? Well, yeah, certainly on some more expensive bikes, it's really hard to adjust the front end yeah. at all, isn't it? So I can see why making buying bikes harder is not a good thing for the bike industry. But at the end of the day, I mean, what happens to the bike industry, it doesn't matter all that much to many cyclists, does mm. it? Because there will always be bikes to buy, brands might go bankrupt, but more will come along in their wake, won't they? More importantly than that, we should probably ask the question, does it put people off? Mm. Well, are you still gonna buy a drill? Well, yes, I will buy a drill, because I want slash need a drill, I'm just going to put off buying it for a bit because I don't actually, I've got an old one that does the job. In this anecdote, what you're saying then is, no, it doesn't matter that much. Well, no, I'm not saying that actually because right. I think there's a difference between drilling and cycling. Would you believe it, yeah. right? Because if you want to drill holes, you need a drill, mm. don't you? Whereas if you want to go cycling, you still need a bike, because well, yeah. what the point is. But no, no, I mean, that is a valid point. But there are lots of other things you could be doing instead of cycling, aren't there? None of them are as good, in my humble opinion, but there are other options. If you want to drill, you need a drill. If you want to have some fun exercise on a Sunday morning, you could do lots of different things, couldn't you? That is a fair point, uh, but can Thank I make you. a recommendation? Yeah. Uh, you do a search for the local handyman who will do the job properly <laughs> with the correct drill. Uh, but to a cyclist, it's probably not too off-putting, is it? I guess, though, to a non-cyclist, it might well be. Do you know the answer to this? Uh, what the answer could be to this? By a 1996 Giant TCR? No, it goes back to what you said before. Got Gravel it. bikes. So a bike that promises flexibility. Ride it anyway, basically a road bike on the road, good for non-technical off-road. Uh, most are quite easily adjustable because, well, integration isn't so prized. Uh, robust, and most bike brands have just the one option of gravel bike, don't they? Well, that is a very good point, actually. 
Yeah. Thank you. So basically, like like a gravel drill, a gravel bike yeah. is going to be the saviour of, I reckon of so. bikes. Yeah. Well, I mean, for enthusiasts such as ourselves, I think it's absolutely fine to have a multitude of options. Oh, it's great, in fact, to have a multitude of options because a lot of us enjoy that. But Trek's move to simplify the buying purchase and also their own stock issues could well prove to be a good one. Well, I know. think so. I mean, there are points in my life, which I can't think of a precise one, a specific one right now, where you are put off just because of the amount of options available. A bit like your drill. Leaf blower? Um, no. You just went and bought one? Well, there was one on a really good offer. Was that, was it Aldi? <laughs> No, I'm trying to think of something, but if you have too many options, you're just like, I just don't even know where to start, let alone which of the ones that are suited to me I'm going to choose to purchase. Yeah. Whereas when there's fewer options, it's easier to make the decisions to what you need and what you want, more importantly, as a purchase, isn't it? The other thing as well, actually, when you were saying that, it made me think, you know, it's very easy if someone wants to get into cycling and you walk into a bike shop and you've got someone rightly talking you through all the different options, not only is it bamboozling, potentially slightly off-putting, it also kind of detracts from the purpose of cycling in the first place, doesn't mm. it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like it's, it suddenly becomes like about the bike as opposed to about the ride. Yeah. Whereas if you're a complete obsessive, then it's yeah, kind of about both all the time, isn't it? I have remembered a specific example. Go on. Uh, Tinder. A big pun? <laughs> that was a joke. I I even if I was to go on Tinder, I wouldn't have much Oh my option, goodness, even sure. a moment, my heart was in my mouth. It's like, where is he going to go with this? Whoa. Uh, right, let's bring it back to cycling. We would love to know your thoughts on this. Has cycling become too uh, complicated in terms of the options you have to buy bikes? And is Trek Moves a good one for the whole industry? Let yeah. us know in the comments section below. I'd also be interested if anyone can think of a reason, like another option. How else do you simplify cycling? Is it the bike brands? I'm sure there's lots. I can't think of them right now. Maybe yeah. one for another show. Yeah. And now it's time for Cycling Shorts. Cycling Shorts now, and we're going to start with more of an update into that new Giro Hammerhead. Actually, it's not called a Hammerhead, is it? What was it called? The Aerohead helmet that looks it's like a Hammerhead. Lines, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it all kicked off last week, didn't it? It did, yeah. In the aftermath of the new helmets, not only launched by Giro, but also Rudy Project, uh, the UCI released a statement later last week saying that they would be banning the specialised head socks and nothing to do with the two <laughs> no. that were just released. Uh, that's the uh, one that looks... Weirdly reminiscent of a condom. Mm. I don't know why, because I mean, technically it doesn't really, but anyway, it's the one that Quickstep and Bora have been using. Actually since July 2022, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's called the TT5, Sorry. Uh, okay. The UCI said in their statement, it contravenes rule 1.3.033. Essentially what they're saying is that the sock part of the helmet is non-essential. Which seems strange, doesn't it? That it's taken them 20 months to decide yeah. uh, that the head sock is a non-essential item. Yeah, and it's not essential, is it? Unless no. you live in Canada in the winter. True, actually, yeah. Um, further to the UCI statement, though, they said that while the new Rudy Project and Giro helmets are adhering to the current guidelines, they raise a significant issue, and we're quoting here, concerning the current and wider trend in time trial helmet design, which focuses more on performance than the primary function of a helmet namely to ensure the safety of the wearer in the event of a fall. Mm. Uh, the aforementioned helmet manufacturers and related teams have obviously been very quick to condemn this new move, basically highlighting how much time and money they've spent in the development of these new helmets, which do adhere to the current rules and which were approved by the UCI before they were used in competition last week. Yeah, that's right. You can understand their frustration, can't yeah, definitely. You? Um, in fact, you can see Giro's frustration because they put an Instagram post, including a copy of the letter from the UCI, basically saying, well done, guys, yeah, that's all good to go. Um, but you can't imagine someone at the UCI, on the flip side, can't you, receiving a sample of the new Giro helmet and thinking like, oh my God, like, what is this? Yeah. Like, this is terrible, but technically it doesn't contravene any of our <laughs> current guidelines, yeah. but we just didn't think anyone would do this. Yeah. Just one of the rule makers saying, does that fit within our rules? Yes. Oh, no. Oh, God, why do we not bring think? back hair net helmets? It's yeah. simple, wasn't it? It's just too much choice now. So, well, there is, you know, yeah. We were I mean, saying earlier. We're paralysed. I couldn't buy a TT helmet now. 
Well, no, I wouldn't want to, I don't think. <laughs> right, let's also go back to that news that Giant have just released an update to the venerable TCR, which is now in its 10th generation. Yeah, the bike, as we said earlier, sparked a revolution when it was launched in 1996 with its compact frame that ripped up what at that point was a very well-established rule book, wasn't yeah. it? Uh, the latest one is, can you guess? Stiffer, lighter, and more aero. Ah, oh, damn it! Let's well, be fair to Giant. What I was going to go with. Uh, that is what people want by and large from a top-tier road bike, isn't it? Yeah. And they aren't promising revolution this time around; just refinement. It has still got the compact frame, though, and I think it looks great. I do. Yeah, I have got a real soft spot for the TCR, mm. despite never having owned one. Never owned one. Um, there is, if anyone's interested, an old GCN video where I compared. I think it was version eight to version one of the TCR. I'm not entirely sure how that video has stood the test of time, but uh, it's there if you want to have a watch. Well, I suspect that that video has aged about as well as you have. I don't quite know. No, what fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't sound, well, doesn't I mean, sound we good. Can, we can just let the viewers decide yeah, right. how well you've aged. That will go down well. <laughs> no, uh, more tech news now. This time, carbon fiber. So a company called Scale told Composites World. Oh, that Composites World. That yeah. sounds like a good website. Did Bridgewood tip you off onto that? No, one? it was uh, Hank, actually. <laughs> really? No, of course it wasn't. <laughs> anyway, Scale have just unveiled their new bio power line of composite, uh, which are a mix of natural fibres, which they say could lower cost by 40% and improve greenhouse gas emissions by 95% when you compare it to carbon fibre. Well, that's not bad, 95% no. reduction, is it? They also said that just 10% it added into a carbon fibre weave could reduce vibration and harshness by 30%. Nice. Well, it did strike me whilst reading this that it sounds very reminiscent of flax fibre. Remember yeah. that? It was adopted by some brands a few years ago. But I did like how the CEO of Scale said that the cycling market was a perfect test bed for them because, and I quote here, Go on. cyclists are sophisticated customers with an unwavering demand for performance. <laughs> yeah. I mean, actually, I suppose that is pretty much what we're like, isn't it? I think most of them are, yeah. 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 I mean, we've overcomplicated cycling, but mm. that's because we're, what was it, sophisticated and uh, unwavering. Well, maybe we're not, now that you reiterate it to me. Yeah, well, maybe, yeah. Anyway, jokes aside, if it can lower the carbon footprint of frame production uh, at no cost to the performance, that is a good thing. Yeah, it's hard it? to find a negative. Um, I watch with interest to see what happens there. It might be like flax, might not it? Well, it may, yeah, maybe it is like flax. Now, we talked last week about how the UK government is looking into changing legislation on e-bikes, potentially increasing the power, and also changing them from being pedal assist to allowing throttle activated mode. Mm. Uh, we said that UK cycling groups were alarmed at this, and as if in answer to some of their fears, we've got a story now from Phoenix, Arizona, where basically local police have banned anyone under 18 from riding an e-bike. Yes, now this seems like it's in response to electric motorbikes, but it's under a catch-all term of e-bike because it's a bike with an electric motor. Yeah, now the fact that you can drive but not ride an e-bike sounds bonkers. Frankly. Yes, this is true. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where I'm sure someone somewhere just didn't think about what they were calling it. But it is a bit worrying, isn't it? Because then you're like, well, okay, like if you can't ride that e-bike, why can you ride that e-bike? And then suddenly you end up having to register mm. your e-bike in order to be able to ride it, and it just like... Well, this is the quandary we're in with all these innovations in terms yeah. of e-scooters and e-bikes. You know, politicians and rule setters just don't know where to classify them or what to do. Do you know what they should do? Simplify it. It's just got overcomplicated. One gravel bike. Well, yeah, just you could. Yeah, every every household's allowed one gravel bike. <laughs> it's not allowed a motor. Just like just simplify it. Uh, right uh, now, we are going to finish cycling shorts with an update from Aulu or Olu, I think. Olu. Olu. Yeah, uh, which is the capital of winter cycling. It is not in Canada because Canadian winters are not harsh enough. No, Olu. That. Well, you say that, I've got a comment to read in a minute. Have you? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, like, given Olu is in Finland, mm. that's where winters are real tough. Yes. Anyway, comment in a minute. 
people there even tougher. In Finland. Like. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah. And I had loads of comments underneath last week's show from Oulu residents. So here is one that we saw from Grizrock. See, that's a tough name. Grizrock. Grizrock. It is a tough yeah. name, isn't it? Uh, he said, great to see Oulu uh, finally get a mention on the GCN show. I cycle here every day of the year. I've been meaning to suggest to you that you guys come to visit for ages. Uh, here we are building a big network of segregated bike-only paths, and we've already got over 800 k's of segregated paths wow, for so bikes and pedestrians. It's a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, we have strict rules about regularly plowing the snow and gritting the main cycle paths. And we have cycling agents. Whoa. Cycling agents. Basically, they're cyclists that give feedback on the main bike path conditions throughout the winter. And in return, they can receive local bike shop vouchers, lights, etc. Uh, I'd be happy to show you around and act as an interpreter where required. Uh, we're a coastal city affected by the Gulf Stream. It's not usually as cold as inland Canada, it's true, oh. is where I get it from, but we did have a week with a maximum of 31 degrees Celsius back in January. And yes, so I will need his lights. You say minus 31? Yep. Not plus 31? No, minus 31. Minus 30, okay, because that does sound not, cold. Not as hard as inland Canada still, apparently. What? Uh, but has suggested that you do need to bring light side okay. because they'd only get about four hours of light during the heart of winter. Crikey. Uh, depending on the conditions, you might also want to borrow some spiked tyres for the trip as well. Well, there you go. I now know more about Olu than I ever thought yeah. I would do. Well, this time last week, we didn't even know how to spell it. And you've got four letters, we got one wrong. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in, in hindsight, that's unforgivable, <laughs> isn't it, really? But yeah, and no, I genuinely, I really, I think that'd be great to go next winter. Yeah. Well, good luck. Yeah, th thanks, mate. Cheers. No You're worries. not coming. No, I've only got a gravel bike. <laughs> no, gravel bike would be perfect. All right. You We're put studded tyres on. Right? Yeah, oh, no. Yeah. Um, anyway, there you go. So uh, yeah, oh, Luke, uh, watch out because uh, we're going to be coming. So I, another comment said um, we could go in December, but it won't be quite as cold as January. Um, but I thought a pre-Christmas trip to Finland would be good. Yeah, July sounds brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Hack forward slash bodge of the week now. Uh, sorry, crack on with the three we've got for you this week. I've got a slight technical glitch with the uploader. We at the have uh, Killian has obviously been spending a little bit too much time practicing for his Tour of Flanders sportif and not enough time doing his job. <laughs> Fixing the upload, yeah. Basically, yeah, doing what he's supposed to be doing. Yeah, writing articles. He's doing everything but his actual job at the moment. Basically, he? he's trying to yeah, find any is, other yeah. job within the company he can possibly do. Presenting, writing articles, training for a sport eve. Get on with your job, Killian. <laughs> Uh, it should be up, apparently, again very soon. So it's upload.globalcyclingnetwork.com. It doesn't work for you straight away. Uh, head back the next day and try it again. It should be ready again soon. And just uh, get in touch with Killian. Just ask him what he's up to. I was about to read his email address out then. <laughs> I won't do, just to be fair to him. Right, the first one this week comes in from Tim, who simply put, seen at work. Uh, this looks to be some kind of solar-powered garden light uh, fixed to the rear of a BMX. Well. I mean, as far as bike lights go, I'd say that's fairly ineffective, uh, unless there was another one on the other side and you could use them as indicators. Mm. But well, even then, actually, the bike's not wide enough. It just wouldn't work, would it? No. Well, I would say that any light is better than no light, at least. Mm. If you're riding at night. Yeah, I mean, technically, a still... yellow one is quite illegal. It's illegal, is it? You've you got get... to have a red light, haven't you? No, I can't imagine anyone getting pulled over for the wrong colour light. On a bike, sure. Well, I don't know, mate. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, I can see, I can tell you wouldn't risk it. No. You're I mean, going out with yellow light. Cycling is pretty complicated, mate, but that is one thing that is simple. <laughs> You've got to have a white light at the front and a red one at the back. <laughs> Oh, oh God, right, yeah, come on then. I'm going to say that's a bodge. Well, I'm going to yeah. say it's a bodge as well. I mean, bike lights are pretty cheap. Oh my days. goodness me, yeah. You Even get... bright red ones. Yeah, I mean, in the old days, they were quite cheap as well. I the think the garden solar light might actually be more expensive than a rear red light for a bike. Yeah, I mean, potentially, I suppose you might have that just hanging around. Didn't you make a GCM video about turning your iPhone into a primitive bike light yeah. once? <laughs> it wasn't an iPhone, it was an Android. Oh, yeah, okay. No, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, you wouldn't want gaffer bike. tape an expensive iPhone to the front of your bike, but uh, my Android phone's pretty blooming cheap. There you go. Oh, that's a hack if ever there was one. <laughs> right, um, okay, moving swiftly on to this one sent in from Mark from uh, here in the UK. A cheap solution to the post-ride wipe-off. 
Uh, much easier to get into the nooks and crannies. I'm assuming he means bike there. Yeah. Um, anyway, a cheap he... home bargain gardening glove set, which have the perfect texture to take grime off. I mean, you could wear them in the shower as well, I suppose, couldn't you? Well, yeah, but you'd want to have the shower first before you did your bike, wouldn't you? Yeah, that's true. Most of the time I like to do my bike before the shower. Yeah. So you might need two pairs of gloves. Um, are they waterproof though, Mark? I mean, that would be the thing, like... Well, I guess if it's not too cold outside, it wouldn't matter that much, would it? Just brush it off. Or get it get wet. Well, just, just shove your hands into the bucket of warm, soapy water. I, I prefer a sponge, if I'm totally honest. Why is that? I think sponges are really effective. That's <laughs> more, more effective than fingers. Than gardening gloves, yeah. I mean, I do think Have that. you ever tried this? Mm, no. no. I mean, I, I think sponge for the big parts, but like... Like for nooks said, and crannies. For, for nooks and crannies, surely a finger's got to be better than a sponge. <laughs> <laughs> All right, mate. Yeah, go on then. What are you going to say? A hack? I don't know. <laughs> you, feel, I, you feel like you've I nailed feel, your colour to your mouth. Well, I feel like I need to try this before I cast judgement. <laughs> I can sort of see why it might be um, of use. Well, normally we're very quick to pass judgement. That's the whole point. Well, I'm going hack then. Oh, Dan's got the hack. No, I'm gonna say, um, I'm gonna say bodge because I feel like it's gonna get damp and soggy, and I'd rather have a sponge. But uh, anyway, I like what you've done there, Mark. I like the, you know, you're sure your hands are getting soggy when you use a sponge. Well, it's that thing, isn't it, about like, is it better to have like exposed skin and get it wet because then it will dry really quickly, or is, are you it's better like, off I mean, like, wrapping it in cl in like soggy clothing? Maybe take the gloves off when you finish cleaning your bike. I mean, that is a fair point, I suppose. I, mean, I feel like your hands are only going to be wet for the same amount of time, whichever method you use. I mean, again, that is a fair point, yeah. Right. Well, you're saying bodge, I'm saying hack that one, strangely. I'm going to regret that, I think. Yeah. Uh, final one this week comes in from Aidan, who said, trying to shave four watts off at 50 kilometres per hour over 40 k's. <laughs> <laughs> I like the fact that you've used the Huggies nappy box. Oh, we haven't been well, describing though. them, have we? Oh, good point, yeah. yeah right, do your best to describe that. Uh, well, it, it is a man uh, straddling uh, his bicycle, uh, looking very cool, but with a uh, Huggies cardboard nappy box over his head and a bit of cling film. Um, and it looks quite reminiscent, doesn't it, of a Giro Aero head? <laughs> it doesn't. Too. Doesn't look too far off, does it? No, it doesn't. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, you might have nailed that one, Aiden. Well, I think that fits within current UCI regulations. <laughs> <laughs> Send it in, see if it gets approved, and we'll see you at a local 10 mile time trial in the not too distant future. Yeah, genius. Uh, thanks very much, Aiden, and everybody else who sent hacks and bodges in over the last week. As we said, keep trying. Uh, hopefully we'll have some to show you this time next week. It feels like a challenge, actually, doesn't it? See if you can upload your hacks and bodges this week, because, uh, yeah. Yeah. It might be tough. Otherwise, next week we'll just have a picture of Killian and just uh, bodge. <laughs>It's time now for Caption Competition, that part of the show where you get a chance to get your hands on a coveted, really coveted GCN Camelback water bottle. Um, still no arrival yet. Yeah, I gathered. Yeah, from uh, of the new GCN branded Camelback bottles. I don't know how pleased we'll all be then when they do, they do arrive though. Oh, they're going to be amazing. It's nice in the modern world to have to wait for something, isn't it? Very good point. Yeah. That's a positive spin. <laughs> it, mate. Yeah. Always uh, here, mate. Always here. Yeah. Uh, right then, anyway, uh, you know what the aim of the game is. If you don't, uh, you've got to put a witty caption in the comment section down below that uh, relates to a photo we'll give you in just one second, but to get your eye in, we'll do results from last week. Uh, this was last week's photo of Jonas Finnegal in the individual time trial on day one of Terreno Adriatico, complete with brand new Giro time trial helmet. <laughs> Our winner this week is Rob Chastain, who put caption, somewhere a beauty salon is missing its hair dryers. <laughs> they are that sort of sign. They are. You don't see them many, uh, much anymore, do you? Or is it just me? Do I not go past many hair salons with those shoes? No, I think, I, I feel like it was, um, wasn't it for perms? How uh, was it? You used to get a lot of... Um, I used to get a lot of old ladies sat in there yeah, maybe. for like hours on end. To get, get I mean, it's so long ago that those old ladies are probably younger than we are now. <laughs> I mean, those particular old ladies wouldn't be, but uh, I know what you no. mean. Yeah. Uh, well, perms are coming back in, aren't they? 
So I'm told. Are they really? Well, that's good for you, mate. Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> uh, right, this week's photo, I'll get in touch with this on Facebook, uh, Rob, and we will get that bottle out to you if you send us your address. This week's photo is from the final podium of Terreno Adrasico. Uh, no prize for guessing that Jonas Finnegal won the overall classification if he didn't watch the race. Uh, on his right is Jai Hindley downing a bottle of Prosecco. In the middle is the winner, Jonas Vinigor, downing a bottle of Prosecco. And to the left of the photo, we have second place Juan Ayuso, who appears to be waiting. I will get you started. Juan Ayuso regrets giving the other two a head start at the World Prosecco Drinking Championships. Uh, hmm. That was all right, isn't it? That's not too bad. Steady. I mean, you might have finished it already. He might be doing him a disservice. He might have Mess, just yes. necked that entire bottle of Prosecco. Yeah. Uh, Juan Ayuso becomes new Prosecco drinking world champion. Yeah. There you go. Uh, either one of those uh, should be fairly easy to beat. Um, get involved in the comments section down below and we will pick out a winner next week who may be the first one to get a GCN. Yeah. I mean, it's got, they've got to be coming anytime soon now, <laughs> haven't they? They really should be here by now. Mm. Otherwise... It's probably Killian's fault, should we say? Yeah, well, definitely. I'm pretty sure it's Killian's fault. Just before we let you know what gold we've got coming up for you on GCN this week, a few comments. Uh, starting with three underneath last week's show. Uh, Bike Tribe 7071, but if Ollie won't wear it, the UCI should ban it. That seems like a clear litmus test. That is a very good point, actually, Bike Tribe. I mean, uh, yeah. Because Ollie will try most things mm. in the quest He would try. Speed. I don't actually believe him. Well, they wouldn't wear one. Yeah. Yeah. That's true, actually. Mm. You would put it on and be like, oh, I've just, you know, like, just... Just <laughs> yeah. now, yeah. You know. Yeah, no, you good point. Um, but but in principle, I think Bike Tribe is right. Uh, Griffith D said, um, in my opinion, time trialling is like the F1 of cycling. There should be rules, of course, but keep the time trial stuff in time trials. Let them go crazy, but then don't let it bleed in to road races. Um, keep the two things separate. Mm. So uh, everyone can look like star troopers on time trial bikes, but then look like bicyclists for all the other stages. <laughs> but they're not bicyclists if they're time trialists. It was well, exactly, yeah. <laughs> separate species, aren't they, pretty much? Uh, on a different subject, JB Gill wrote in saying, watching this episode from Toronto, Canada on March the 5th, where it was plus 15 degrees Celsius today and no snow in sight for over two weeks. Wow. So we've had snow in sight in the last two weeks. And I'm not sure we've had any days that are over 15 degrees so far this year. No, we haven't. No, that is a good point. Well, sticking with... Uh, the weather theme mm, yeah. uh, under the Zone 2 video that went up on Saturday. Wilson Robb said, have you guys ever made a video on dry roads? Um, to which uh, Quest Giver Siradis said, only when Manon tries to make a video about riding in the rain. <laughs> which is actually like, it's ironic but true. Yes. Um, if, if ever you want the weather to be good, just try and do something that requires rain and uh, there you go, it'll yeah. all dry up. We have had, it was the wettest February ever, apparently this also year. the warmest, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm. It's a bit sad. Pressing it? on both fronts really, isn't it? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, not, yeah, it's really bad. Underneath high-tech city bikes, that was the first look at the new Orbea Diem. Uh, Bike Try wrote in more aside doing his bad dad dancing, please. That made my day. I don't think we need to see any more of that, I quite frankly. I um, agree with you, sir. Si. That's uh, Bike Tribe's second comment of the week. So, uh, yeah, more of those, please. You're clearly on fire. Um, under the seven things we learned about commuting on an e bike, um, loads and loads of people getting stuck in there. Um, Randy Carey Walden said 22,000 miles on my e bike as a daily commuter, 10 miles each way over five years, bought a second battery two years ago, sold my car. $160 annually for maintenance of the e-bike, $300 every third year for new tires, etc. That is pretty cool. That's some serious mileage. That is a lot of miles, isn't it? Yeah, that is awesome. So, uh, yeah, fair play, Randy. Uh, so Simone Anelli wrote, For me, the best improvement in commuting by bike has been getting panniers and mudguards. Not having a backpack that weighs you down and causes back pain is fantastic. Uh, while Slash 90 it Itter, uh, Italia, I guess that is, uh, this series of videos about the commuting is really appreciated. Keep it coming. Maybe a video on the best bag, backpack, etc. to use would also be useful. Yeah, well... Uh, there are more 
cycling to work commutary videos coming up very soon. We've got one, I think, next week. And yeah, luggage is on the list mm -hmm. of things to look at. So, uh, so stay tuned. Um, and then lastly, uh, Kevin Hoffman said, uh, Matt, uh, who was in that video, laughing at me going up hills is pure joy. And that is what any ride should be. Um, and yeah, I think he genuinely was absolutely loving life, um, giving me a mega hard time. Mm, sure he was. Yeah. Right then, coming up on the channel this week, we'll start with tomorrow, which will be Wednesday, if you're watching this show as it comes out on YouTube. We've got our big Milan San Remo preview coming out. So this Saturday, it's the first of the five men's monuments uh, in Italy, the longest of them all, of course, although it's slightly shorter this year. It Only is, yeah. 288 kilometers. And incidentally, if you've been wondering what these t-shirts are alluding to. It's a celebration of La Classicissima, uh, so the first monument of the year this Saturday, available at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. Uh, and whilst we're plugging ourselves, if you head over to globalcyclingnetwork.com, uh, you will see a big written preview as well as loads of other stuff in and around the race on the route to and through the day on Saturday. Plugging ourselves is a weird turn of phrase, yeah, isn't I maybe it? maybe didn't phrase that yeah, quite well. Yeah, I'm not sure I like the idea of plugging myself. Um, well, no. Milan San Remo... Use a sponge. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the preview show will be on GCN Racing, of yes. course, won't it? Um, and can I just say, once again, that it is, I think, the best bike race of the year to watch. Because you only need to watch the final 30 minutes, 45 minutes if you want to give yourself a little bit more anticipation. Yeah, you want the Trey Cappy as yeah, well as the Chepressa and Poggio. Never fails, delivers every time, no anticlimaxes mm. on that race. It's just brilliant. Well, I'll be watching from 9am, but you do you. I mean, I think you won't. You, well, I will. Really? Well, I'm working on it. So you got you. Oh man! I think it might even be starting at eight a.m. Our coverage. <laughs> anyway, oh, I, I want to tune in in mid morning just to hear what you got to say about <laughs> whatever. Crikey! On um, Thursday, uh, as I alluded to earlier, it's cycle to work for beginners. Everything that you need to know about commuting. And on Friday, uh, it's epic epic climbs. If I can even get my words out, uh, this episode is the Taiwan KOM. Yeah, climbs, uh, Taroko Gorge. I think this is the one for the uh, the mega Taiwan KOM challenge. Um, then on Saturday, uh, Hank was appalled at the price of a train fare, mm. so he went and bought a bike for less than the price of the train fare wow. and rode it to his destination instead, uh, which, to be fair to him, was over 100 miles. So, wow. uh, yeah, find out how Hank gets on. Also, to be fair to Hank, the price of a train fare in the UK is probably like a trek in Monda with 105 in it these days. Basically. It's crazy price. Yeah, particularly if you travel first class, like, you know. Like Hank, like Hank expects does. Yeah, so, exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then uh, on Sunday, we've got a bit of a techie one here, actually. Um, so, tyre width. What happens if you supersize your road bike tyres? Uh, Pirelli have sent us uh, four P0 races, four, three P0 races, 26, 30, and 35 mil wow. to find out. Uh, basically, we wanted to see whether the 35 is a penalty on, uh, on good roads. So find out. Do fat tyres slow you down? Yeah, I was going to say the penalty would only be speed, wouldn't it? Not comfort. Well, yeah, we are looking at speed in this. Okay. Fair enough. But, but you can get super comfy on a 30, so it's like, you know, but uh, anyway. Yeah. Wider is better, but is it? Basically is what we're looking at. All right, well, I look forward to watching that on Sunday. That was quite I a might, succinct description, wasn't I it? I might watch that uh, at some point during Milan San Remo. Well, you should, because then if you guys could talk about it in the race, because you'll be a bit like, so, you know, they've been going for six, like four hours, not much is happening. Yeah. Well, actually, guys, uh, Ty is a really interesting one today. Yes. Uh, oh, he looks a bit uncomfortable. Must be on 26s, I think. No one will be riding 26s at Milan no, San Remo. No, they're no right. way. Uh, right, that's all for this week's uh, show. Don't forget to catch uh, the Milan San Remo preview show tomorrow and the last 45 minutes we would recommend of the race this coming Saturday yeah. if you have a subscription to somewhere where you can watch it. Uh, we will see you again this time next week.